Jan, welcome to Validated. Hi, Austin. Thanks a lot for having me. Glad we can get you today. Uh, there's been a bunch of news in the world of Pith um, that I want to talk about. I want to talk about the role of high-frequency oracles in general, uh, the professionalization of blockchain infrastructure, uh, the sort of weird world we find ourselves in of uh, TradFi prop trading shops getting involved in building infrastructure and blockchain as well. Um, I, we've had kind of on previously as well from, from Jump, and I know uh, Pip has some spiritual origins within Jump as well. But I kind of wanted to start out with just sort of a scene set on the landscape we find ourselves in now. Um, what is sort of the impetus for Pith and why do you think we needed another Oracle in blockchain? Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to take that. So the, um, you know, just to take a big step back, right? An Oracle is a piece of technology that, you know, brings data from the outside world onto the blockchain. And this is basically solving a fundamental problem with how blockchains work, which is that by default, you know, there's no way for an application that runs on the blockchain to access data from the outside world, right? So if you want to build a contract that depends on, you know, a market price or the weather or something like that, you know, you need some other system to help deliver that price onto the blockchain. And so oracles basically solve that problem. And, you know, people have been building oracles for a number of years now. You know, Pith is not the first oracle that's on the market. Um, but Pith was actually a reaction to kind of how oracles have been built in the past. So, you know, when we started the project, um, we kind of looked around at different oracles and realized that, first of all, uh, existing oracles don't pay their data providers for the access to the data. So the way oracles worked before PIT is that the oracle would basically operate a number of different nodes. And those nodes could basically scrape the web to retrieve data. And then they would take that data that they scraped from the web and report it onto the blockchain. And you can see why this is an attractive design for building an oracle because, you know, from a technical perspective, it's pretty elegant, right? There's a lot of data on the web. You can access anything and put it on chain. Right. So you can see why people decided to do that. Um, but the problem with this is that, you know, valuable data isn't going to be publicly available on the, on the web. And, you know, coming from a financial market background, one of the things that you know is that financial market data, like prices, you know, low latency connections to NASDAQ or whatever, are very, very expensive. Right. So that financial market data is high value and it's not free. And so if you want to get that kind of data onto the blockchain, um, you need to have a different solution. So, Pith was basically built as a reaction to that observation. Um, and so those oracles, we'd call them third-party oracles, right? It's third parties who put the data on the blockchain. Pith is a first-party oracle where the owners of the data are actually the ones who report that data to the blockchain. So Pith has a network of over 80 data providers right now, which includes some of the biggest traditional finance firms. Uh, these are names you've probably heard of, like Virtue, uh, Tower, um, you know, some of the big crypto exchanges like Coinbase, um, Binance right, all provide their data directly to, to Pith. And um, this gives Pith access to data that other people don't have. Um, for example, Pith has real-time US equity prices, which like you can't really get anywhere else. Um, and so that was one of the things that kind of inspired the design of Pith and like was one of the things that we really wanted to get right when we we're building this Oracle. And we just knew that without the, without the um, data providers, like the owners of the data on board, uh, there'd really be no way to get this data in the long term. And like we knew that this financial market data was super important for um, blockchain applications, so we really wanted to make sure that there was a way for that data to to arrive on chain. Yeah, I think that's like a, an interesting sort of like history of what of how these sorts of protocols end up getting built out. I, I think one of the pieces to kind of dig into a little bit more here is like data in financial markets has historically been considered pretty proprietary. Now, there's all sorts of uh, compliance reasons that these firms hold on to the data, but they also hold on to the data because it's partially considered to be something that can be useful for some form of competitive analysis. So you can use that model data to create backtesting models to see how an algorithm you wrote in 2023 would have performed in you know 2018 or something along those lines and do some forward projections based off of that stuff. So uh, one of the pieces I think that a lot of people don't understand, and I want you to kind of walk us through here, are the incentives that make Pith work. Because it's very easy to look at Pith and say, um, look, this is data being provided largely by really large financial institutions. Uh, historically, these institutions don't really do things altruistically. So they must be getting something out of this in order for them to be willing to participate in it. And uh, 
the assumption there is they're getting something out of us, right? That in some way this enables front running, this enables the trading ahead of markets. That there there's some ability that these large financial institutions have to use this data for uh, things other than price improvement. Let's put it that way. Um, but that's not really the way Pith is set up. So I want to kind of walk through a little bit of of how that incentive structure has been built out and why all these data companies and large financial firms that usually uh, very publicly go to war with each other are collaborating on something like Pith. Yeah, for sure. One of the things that I think has been really interesting about Pith is actually the network of data providers. And like, you know, HST firms are very secretive and competitive and they don't usually work together on a project, right? So it's it's actually been very surprising and impressive that these firms have all kind of agreed to jump on, on Pith. Um, now, the reasons that they do this are, you know, they obviously differ per organization, but I think there's basically two, which is one, um, they have a stake in the network, right? So one of the cool things about crypto generally is that, you know, you can use uh, tokens to provide incentives for people to participate in certain things. And, yeah. you know, the, uh, a big ch- chunk of the PIP tokens have basically been allocated as grants to data providers to kind of, you know, encourage them to provide this data, right? So um, that's one of the reasons they do it is they just own a piece of the network. And um, the second reason is actually... For a lot of these firms, the data is kind of a found resource. Like it's not something that they're currently monetizing. And then like suddenly Pitch shows up and they're like, oh, we can make money from this. Like, oh, that's interesting. Right. Yeah. So, you know, if you're if you're NASDAQ and you're already selling like low latency feeds, you know, fine, you're already monetizing your data. Right. But if you're yeah. an HFT, you know, you can't actually resell the NASDAQ data. Right. That's like licensed by NASDAQ. You're not allowed to redistribute that. Um, but you know, as an HFT, you actually have price data because your trades, your trade prices are actually owned by you. And currently you're not monetizing that, you know, you're tracking it for compliance reasons, as as you mentioned, but um, there's no money associated with it, right? So in some sense, like for a lot of these firms, like it's a found resource that they have this data that's valuable. And so they're kind of like, oh, well, we can contribute to PIT and like maybe we'll make some money from in the future. What is that sort of long-term play in their minds? So, because there, there's one thing to say, like, oh, they can they can think about this as something that's like not harmful for them, but you know, opportunity cost is real. It's not uh, it's not trivial to run blockchain infrastructure. A lot of these firms probably don't have any experience building mm-hmm. stuff on Solana before, let alone keeping validators up. So, uh, you know, basically, why out of all the opportunities of things they could do? was signing up to be a Pith data provider or something on their list? Uh, So I think actually one of the other motivations that a lot of these firms have is that they're interested in crypto and they wanted a way to get involved in crypto, right? Because they see, Hmm. you know, all the stuff happening in crypto and they're like, oh, we want to do something, but they don't really know what to do. You know, trading in crypto is hard. There's a lot of like compliance obligations and things like that that these firms have to deal with. Um, And Pith has actually been kind of a, a little foot in the door to kind of get their feet wet and just like, figure out like, oh, this is how I hold a wallet and like, oh, this is how I sign a transaction. So yeah. I think a lot of firms have actually, um, that's actually been about like, a, a, it's like a hard thing, but it's like a thing they want to learn. So they like are excited to do it in in a weird way. So in terms of um, the process of how this works, right? So in, in a traditional Oracle system, maybe they're scraping data from a website, they're getting data from some sort of people who have like an economic reason that they need to add Oracle data to a chain. So maybe they need a specific feed and that feed isn't something that the Oracle support. So they might pay to to bring that data sort of on chain and then consume it themselves or anyone else on the chain might be able to sort of consume it. So when you're looking at data coming in from Pith, I mean, it's it's a slightly different model because you have um, uh, basically permissioned uh, data providers. And my understanding is there's some sort of weighting algorithm that goes into how those various prices are incorporated. Can you walk us through a little bit of like that logic of taking, you know, data feeds from all these different pr- people and ending up at the end of the day with one number that you see on chain that says USDC is worth $1 today? Yeah. So um, I think this kind of touches on one of the fundamental questions about how you're going to build an Oracle, which is do you have a single source of data or do you have like a blend of multiple sources of data? And there's a, you know, there's a trade-off there um, because if you have a single source of data, uh, you know, you can obviously, everyone can go and see the Binance price, for example, right? They can report that on chain and you can kind of see that everybody agrees on the Binance price and so it's correct. And then, you know, you can use it downstream. Um, The problem with using a single source though is that, you know, it's much easier to manipulate like the price on a single exchange or something like that 
or there could be you know reliability issues like what happens if that exchange has downtime you don't want to, that to cause you know downstream downtime in your defi protocols right so um pith has actually been built as a blended source oracle so we basically take the prices from um all the different data providers and we have an algorithm on chain so that the data providers are basically reporting these prices onto the blockchain continuously by sending transactions and there's a uh, program running on the blockchain that implements a little algorithm that robustly combines the prices and when i say robustly combines them what that means is that you know no single data provider or small group of data providers can like move the price by themselves right they have like limited influence over the price and um basically what that ensures is that you know the the protocol can't be attacked without like a large number of people participating. Yeah. So is that uh, just like a flat weighting system or do you say that the price coming in from, you know, Jane Street is more important than the price coming in from uh, pick another firm? Um, right now it's a flat weighting system. The We have thought about doing like a more variable system. It's just you get into these tricky cases where like you're kind of trying to limit the influence any one person can have. So yeah. you don't want to upweight anyone too much. And then so it just ends up being a little bit hard to kind of decide what the right way to do the weighting is. So it's interesting that like the Oracle problem is very similar to like the multi-sig governance problem where it's hard to figure out what a reliable way to weight the various actions of various folks are in an ecosystem. Like the default in most blockchains is token-based weighting. And that has its own problems because, you know, you have A16Z that bought a bunch of the seed round token of a specific thing. And there's been a few instances where they've actually, like, voted very heavily. And some would say thrown a vote. Others would say executed their contractual obligations as holders of tokens to direct and steer that protocol's future development. And, like, that's a contentious sort of thing in the crypto world in general. There's networks like Solana where the voting is actually entirely done at the validator level and users don't even vote at all, but the comparative stake weight of the validators is, is what actually initiates the voting. So what have you guys thought about over the long term? Like, I, I assume the goal is to bring more and more data providers on, but eventually you're going to have a system where maybe Coinbase is a data provider and Binance is a data provider and the, the volume of data they're providing is 100x what another provider is is bringing. And and also, how do you work about communicating uh, discrepancies in pricing to consumers of data? Well, Coinbase and Binance are actually data providers already, so it's not in the future. But um, the so the thing here is that, you know, you could provide lots of data for lots of different feeds or different assets, right? And if you support 100x more assets, that doesn't actually uh, cause a problem because you can still be sort of uniform weighted within the single asset, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, I don't think it like, I don't think the fact that Binance or Coinbase necessarily has like a bigger reputation necessarily means that they need to get more weight in this particular algorithm because you're kind of optimizing for robustness. Yeah, I guess maybe uh, apart from robustness though, like there are worlds where like, the volume moving through Binance is so much higher than the volume moving through like a, you know, third tier exchange that only services oh, like oh. two markets. Yeah, I so got you. implicitly, shouldn't should one assume that the, the the Binance data is more reflective of what market price is, or is that kind of the wrong way to think about it? Certainly if you have exchanges where there's more volume going through them, right, you'd expect those to be kind of more representative of the market price, right? The way that Pith kind of accommodates for that right now is that a lot of the data providers on Pith are, you know, trading firms and things like that, who are basically, you know, they're HFTs. They have some alpha signal that tells them what the price is. That signal is actually a function of the market prices on a bunch of different places. Right. It includes things like volume and things like that. So we kind of get that for free in some sense, just because of who the data providers are. So Pith initially launched on Solana, and now it supports, you know, something like 30 different blockchains where it publishes data to. And I want to get into the transition from operating on Solana mainnet to Pithnet at some point, too, because I think that's very interesting. But one of the pieces that, you know, a lot of early folks who were consuming Pith data um, had to sort of figure out how to use were these things that were called confidence intervals that were coming in with this data. Um, that was a new fee that they hadn't had access to before from uh, other blockchain oracles. Uh, so can you kind of walk us through a little bit about how confidence intervals are built and also 
how DeFi engineers should be thinking about consuming data that has this as opposed to just your traditional standard, here is one price, here is a dollar value. One of the unique things about Pith is that in addition to every price, we also produce a confidence interval. And the reason we do this is because the um, any given asset actually trades at different prices at different venues around the world at any given point in time. So it's not realistic to say that there's a single price for the asset, right? There's really a probability distribution over prices. Um, and so we just wanted to provide a way for downstream protocols to consume that uncertainty and use it to kind of protect their users in different ways. Now, there's many different ways that you could incorporate the confidence interval into your protocol. It kind of depends on your protocol itself. And it's something that, you know, users have to think about for themselves, right? It's not something where we can tell you what to do. Um, but for example, you know, one thing you could do is you could say, look, I have a price, I'm a lending protocol, let's say the confidence interval is really wide. Maybe I'm not going to liquidate a user unless, you know, the upper bound of the confidence interval, you know, is below the liquidation price or something like that. The, the, the point is just you can incorporate the uncertainty of the of the price into your protocol and, you know, there's different ways to it. Yeah, and I think the, the uncertainty bands are interesting because um, it's a good way of saying how accurate the PIF network thinks a specific data feed is too, right? This is something you see all the time in the difference between accuracy and precision in measurement too, right? And, and error bars are really important when you're looking at all sorts of types of data sets to figure out like, is this price movement statistically significant or not? Or, you know, even though the reporting is the same as the previous interval, like, oh, wow, the confidence interval jumped like, you know, two standard deviations. That's that's meaningful, even if the price has not technically moved. Um, so it's very interesting to sort of see how people can actually incorporate this stuff. That's totally right. And, you know, one of the cases where I think the confidence intervals have really um, proven their value is in cases where there's an asset that is trading on multiple exchanges, except you know, the prices on those exchanges have diverged for some reason, right? So this tends to, this has happened actually a few times in, in the history of PIP now, where we've seen like, you know, maybe an exchange suspends withdrawals or like, you know, there's some sort of crisis going on and like people just don't know how to value the asset and different people are doing it differently. And so one of the things that happens in that situation is the confidence interval winds up, right? So that's a way that protocols, or that's like a concrete kind of situation where protocols can use the confidence interval to kind of have some smarter behavior. Yeah. It's interesting. So what is the sort of, um, it, we, we talk about Pith as a high frequency oracle and that high frequency can mean a few different things, right? It can mean that there's a very constant published feed of updates. It can also mean that the data itself is fairly fresh. So how do we think about measuring um, sort of how old a price is in a blockchain oracle? What, are, what have folks usually been used to working with and what are we looking at today with something like Pith? So I think we should distinguish, you know, frequency from latency. I think people tend to conflate like a fast Oracle and they don't specify whether they mean latency or frequency. So, you know, latency is basically uh, how long does it take from the price for the price to go from the exchange or whatever the original source is, you know, through to the users of the protocol. And frequency is just, you know, how many of those updates do you get per second, right? So you could have a system that has high latency and high frequency, Right, or you could have a system that has low latency but low frequency. Right, so you can have any combination of those things. Yeah, and people don't the... think about this super clearly. Right. Yeah, um, this is your classic yeah. example of like, uh, you know, you can achieve transfer speeds of, uh, you know, several terabytes per second if you drive a semi truck full of hard drives from one city to another, but your latency is very high on that data retrieval. Right. Right. Exactly. Um, so for Pith, you know, we actually try to optimize both latency and update frequency. And, you know, we've done some measurements of this. So the kind of end-to-end latency of like the price, like where you measure basically, you know, what is the price on the underlying exchange? And then you measure like, what is the Pith price? And now you have two time series of prices, right? And you can kind of correlate these two time series and see like what the latency is between them, right? So, you know, we've kind of measured that end-to-end latency. It's like two to three seconds, right? And then we do basically one update every 400 milliseconds. And how does that compare with the speeds of other oracles? Pith is a lot faster than other oracles. Um, I think that's you know maybe not surprising if you have used other oracles on other blockchains and you look at the actual configurations of those of those assets. Like they're they're scheduled to update like once every 10 minutes or something like that, right? So it's not even like I, we're you know in or, order of magnitude faster on probably more than order of magnitude faster on like most of the dimensions, right? Latency and frequency. So um, yeah, we're, we're definitely doing 
I guess, I know it, it almost doesn't even make sense to compare, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I want to get into a little bit of the, the technology and architecture that's underpinning Pith here, because like, I think what you're saying makes a lot of, a lot of sense that like, oh, we can have both oracles that have less latency and they have a higher frequency of data publishing. But that stuff doesn't come free, right? As we sort of know, looking at networks like Solana and compared to Ethereum, like Solana's steady state is 5,000 transactions per second. Ethereum's steady state is about 14. But there are a lot of trade-offs that go with making a network faster. So like, walk me through a little bit of the architecture about how Pith is able to achieve these sort of throughput speeds for uh, you know, Oracle frequency data and latency. And then also, what are some of the trade-offs that come with those decisions? Yeah. So, you know, Pith has gone through a couple different iterations. And um, we knew when we started out building Pith that we wanted to build an Oracle that was optimized for latency and frequency, right? Because again, coming from kind of a trading background, we know that those attributes are important for data. The value of your market data kind of decays as a function of latency, and it decays pretty rapidly. So, um, you know, we knew those attributes were important. That was one of the reasons why we chose to build Pith on Solana in the first place was because, you know, Solana is a blockchain that's optimized for latency and, you know, transactions per second, right? So actually, the, the primary way that Pith achieves a lot of these properties is that we use Solana. Um, and it's it's been great. I mean, you know, I've actually been really impressed with the with the Solana blockchain. The more like Pith has expanded to other chains, like I come back and I'm like, you know, I started on Solana. And like, actually, Solana is really pretty good. It's really pretty fast. Like, it's quite impressive. And I don't know, I, I've just gotten more impressed uh, as I've looked at other stuff. But um, yeah, so we knew we wanted to be fast. We started building it on Solana. Um, then last year, basically, we kind of realized that there's a lot of people who are building on other chains beyond Solana. And we didn't really understand how the, the whole crypto ecosystem was going to play out, right? Like, Maybe there's certain types of blockchains that are better suited for certain types of applications. We're not really sure. Um, and so we kind of thought that, look, if you want to be an Oracle, like an infrastructure provider, like our goal is really to provide those prices to everybody, right? It doesn't make sense to be an Oracle on just one chain. You really want to provide the prices to developers, no matter what technology is the right choice for them, right? So we kind of went on this journey of how do we go and, you know, go from just being a Solana Oracle to being an Oracle that works everywhere. And as part of that, what we did is we basically created um, PithNet, which is an instance of Solana. It's like a separate Solana network that uh, we use to kind of provide, to combine the prices, like do that price aggregation stuff we were talking about earlier, um, and deliver the prices from there to other blockchains. And again, you know, the way that we get the high frequency and low latency in that case is we use that same Solana technology. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit about that sort of evolution from running Pith on mainnet to running it on Pithnet. So walk me through a little bit of like why that decision was kind of made and and what, because you, you guys are, are were, and now there's a few, but you were the first ones to take the Solana code base and say, uh, we love this thing, we actually want to deploy it in sort of a private sidechain instance. Yeah, so... You know, we basically, again, this is part of our journey into kind of being this multi-chain protocol. And we kind of had this idea that we want it to be multi-chain. And our initial way of doing this was thinking, okay, we'll just do it on Solana and we'll bridge it over to other chains and like, that'll yeah. work, right? Um, but, you know, we started talking to people building other chains and like, they just thought this was weird. They're like, so my layer one, now depends on another layer one. And like, it just ended up being a really hard conversation. And so we kind of um, decided that it would make more sense to basically have a network that the data providers ran themselves, right? So you're kind of already depending on the data providers. Now the data providers run the nodes of PitNet as well. So it's kind of a permission to app chain. And that way there's like no additional trust assumptions or anything like that. And it just seemed like developers preferred that model over like, you know, now having the Solana validators in there and yeah. So yeah. Um, that's kind of why we ended up making that decision. I think... There have been some other things that have been uh, good about making that decision. Um, one is that we can really, really scale up like the number of feeds that we offer, right? Because mm. the gas on this chain is effectively free. Like we just give it to ourselves. So right. um, that really lets us do a lot of transactions. Like Solana is very cheap, but like 
you know, you start listing hundreds of fees, updating every slot, and like the cost can't add up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That that makes that makes sense. Um, so at this point, like, have you guys done any optimization to that runtime to fit your needs, or are you basically just using the raw protocol binaries like in your own ecosystem? Uh, we actually just rolled out a network upgrade uh, and sort of soft launched it, where we actually made a change to the validator itself. In our initial version of this, you know, multi-chain protocol, we were basically taking these prices on Pitnet and we we're kind of sending them in individual like little batch payloads to other chains. So we take like five price fees, put them together to a message, and then you know send it through Wormhole to other chains. And um, this was fine; it worked. But one of the problems is that uh, sometimes like you want to use two different feeds at the same time. Like you have ten feeds in your lending protocol, and you need the price of all of them. And so you know you want to use Bitcoin, you want to use ETH. They're in different messages. Now you got to put both of them on chain. It's more expensive. Um, right. And so there was like just some cost considerations there. There was also some uh, network bandwidth considerations where, you know, we're we're bridging prices from PitNet to other blockchains using Wormhole. And there's some bandwidth cap on Wormhole. And like we send right. a lot of data, right? Like we want to be able to send, you know, multiple updates per second for 300 different things. And so, you know, it, it adds up again. And so... We we kind of had a cap on the number of messages we wanted to send, so we were sending sort of one update per second previously, and um, we kind of wanted to bring that down to 400 milliseconds, but we couldn't do that without like you know putting way too many messages into Wormhole. So what we ended up doing is we ended up uh, modifying the PitNet validator so that it actually constructs a Merkle tree of all the PIT prices on every slot. So we put this into the validator because. Uh, you want something that's kind of able to look at the global state of the blockchain, which is like hard to do with individual transactions. Like you could imagine having the the uh, Merkle tree be like an account on Solana, but then doing the updates would kind of end up locking the entire chain state every single time you did it, which is like not something we wanted to do. So we just put that Merkle tree computation into the validator itself. And then now we just send the roots of that Merkle tree to other chains using um, Wormhole. And that lets us actually do Basically, so now you get one wormhole message, right? And it has conceptually all the prices in it. And so uh, it lets us increase the update frequency. It's actually much cheaper on target chains. It's somewhere between 30 and 90% cheaper, depending on how many prices you're doing in one update. So um, that's been a pretty big win for us. That's really cool. I'd love to kind of dig in a little bit more on that. So how does that retrieval work? Of Let's say I'm on... Ethereum or Avalanche, and I want to consume a price feed, but all I have is this Merkle root. Where am I actually going and fetching the the data from? So, if you're on a different chain and you want to basically put a pith price update onto your onto your chain, um, you basically need to get two things. You need to get the the work the root of the Merkle tree from Wormhole, right, which has these Wormhole signatures. So you can basically prove it's valid, and then you need to get the Merkle proof for each of the individual prices that you want to put onto the blockchain. And those Merkle proofs are actually stored on Pitna. So there's kind of a rolling buffer of those Merkle trees where you know you can extract the proof from the Merkle tree. So there's kind of this like circular buffer of those trees on Pitna. And basically what you do is you say, okay, I have the current um, wormhole tested Merkle root. It's for this slot. Let me go to Pitna and look up the Merkle tree for that slot. And then I get the proof. And then I package all of that into a message. And then you can just send that message to the target chain. Now, that process seems a little complicated, and it is. Uh, so it obviously seems slightly off chain. Make... Oh, it's absolutely an off chain process. But like, yeah. yeah, like, you know, if you're an end user, you probably don't want to be contacting both of these different services and interfacing with them or whatever. Yes. So, Pith basically, there's like some software you can run. It's just like a web service that connects to both um, Wormhole and PithNet and basically does all the glue for you. So, you just hit that web service and you say, look, I want an update for these feeds and it'll give you the binary. Yeah, got it. So how do you think of, um, like, one of the questions we've been sort of exploring a bit on this show is like the evolution of DeFi and blockchain from like like DeFi 1.0 is like basic AMM single functions where everything is 100% on chain. 
now we see that DeFi 2.0, like there's a little bit of more flux in there. So whether it's a real world asset protocol like Homebase, which is tokenizing mm-hmm. actual real estate somewhere, or even Credix, which is doing you know credit facilities and loans in uh, developing markets, these things now are pulling more data from things that are off chain, and they're relying more on sort of the dumb human part, for lack of a better term, the, the dumb contracts, right? The the paperwork, the courts, the legal system when something goes wrong. So, what are you guys when you're when you're architecting Pith? Like most of this happens on a coordination on PithNet, which is sort of, for lack of a better word, a permissioned proof of authority style network. Um, but then, when you're talking about someone like fetching a price from a root to then bring it onto them their chain themselves, you know that's not running. Th- that that whole experience not going through a wormhole. If you think about like chain of custody, for lack of a better term, like y- you leave blockchain for a component there to sort of get information and pull it back. So talk to me a little bit about what you guys think is like the ideal ratio of what needs to be on, not necessarily ratio, mm-hmm. but the ideal distribution of what needs to be on chain, what doesn't need to be on chain, and sort of um, where, like what areas are true trust and safety issues and what areas are just like, we actually don't need a blockchain for this part. This is just an API. Yeah. Yeah, this is a great question. It's actually something we've been thinking about a lot because, you know, blockchains are really good for some things, right? But they're really bad in other things. Like the performance of a blockchain relative to running a computer somewhere is like, it's way worse, right? So I think um, there's a whole interesting engineering game of like, how do you get, uh, systems to operate at like the performance levels of off-chain systems, right? While still having the security and verifiability guarantees of the on-chain systems. And so that's kind of what Pith has been doing. And like this, this kind of touches on something we haven't really talked about, but, um, you know, Pith has this new design for an Oracle where it's a pull Oracle. And what that means is that Pith kind of generates, you know, through this process of the Merkle trees and wormhole, right? It's kind of generating these off-chain payloads, these off-chain data payloads, right? Now, look, there's a there's a chain of trust for those off-chain payloads, right? If you look at any sure. given off-chain payload, it actually came from PitNet, and you can go look at PitNet and see what prices went into it. So there's a, there's a full auditability trail for each of these things. But we're kind of generating these payloads, and they just sit there, you know, off-chain. Anyone if you're dropping off-chain, they're not maybe useful there, but they sit there. And then we make it kind of user's responsibility to grab those payloads and put them on chain when they need them, right? And the reason we did this, so, you know, you want to go use some protocol that needs the pit Bitcoin price. You could take the payload, you put it onto the blockchain, you say, this is the current Bitcoin price. We can validate that full chain of trust on chain, right? Like there's a PIP contract that can say, yes, the wormhole signatures are valid. Yes, the Merkle proofs are valid. That proves that this data came from PitNet, right? And I know that on PitNet, everything's auditable. So uh, we can verify that, and then you can go use your downstream protocol. And the reason we went with this design is because it's a lot more efficient than doing everything on the blockchain, right? The mm. alternative design, actually a number of oracles have already done this on other, um, other blockchains, is you kind of continuously update the on-chain press, right? And so in order to do that, like Pith would have to basically send the transaction to, say, Ethereum, Every single time you want the Bitcoin price to update, Pith has to send a transaction. And yeah. that's a very, very expensive thing to do, especially if you want to do a lot of updates per second or you want to do um, you know, a lot of different assets, right? So that's just not like a, a smart way to build the protocol. And um, that's kind of how we ended up at the place where we are, where we're basically optimizing for... We have a design that basically gives us better performance uh, while still retaining the same security and auditability guarantees. So, like, how does a user or how how does someone then initiate, like, a call for a price update? Yeah, so, you know, Pith has a contract that lives on, uh, we're on 30 different blockchains right now, so there's a contract that lives on those blockchains. And that contract has a function, basically, right, that you can call where you give it a binary data payload. And it takes that data payload and it kind of verifies it, right? So it says, look, uh, is it signed by Wormhole? Okay, here's the Merkle root. Uh, here's the Merkle proofs. Are those valid? Right. And if everything checks out, it says, okay, this is the price that's in this payload and it just saves it on chain. And then anybody can basically read the current price out of that contract. The way that users, you know, pull the price on chain 
is they basically call that you know function on the contract with the right data payload. And you could get the data payload from one of these web services, right? And this web service is, you know, the Pit Data Association runs an instance of this web service, but it's completely permissionless, right? The web service is just connecting to the PitNet, you know, peer-to-peer network, and it's connecting to the Wormhole peer-to-peer network, and it's kind of just gluing some of the data together. So, you know, you can go spin up your own one of these too if you want. Yeah, interesting. Um, I think that's a really interesting solution to kind of the the problems of updates here. I I think we're going to see more um, protocols being built at this like with this kind of creative combination of off chain and on chain. You know, actually, if you go back in time, there were some dexes that had you know off chain orders right that were signed and then could be executed on chain. And I actually think some things like that are good ideas that um, you'll start yeah. to see coming back as people like really try to get the performance to improve. Yeah, I was going to say there's a lot of hybrid Oracle. Uh, excuse me. There's a lot of hybrid exchanges that are launching where components like the order matching is centralized, but then you actually have to, you know, sign with your ledger to actually transfer to to execute and fulfill the order after the fact. So there, there's kind of a lot of interesting uh, models for there as as this kind of gets going. Um, you mentioned you guys support over 30 different blockchains now. I assume a bunch of that 30 is made up with various layer two solutions on Ethereum as well. Yes, yes. From Pith's perspective, each of those L2s is basically an independent blockchain at this point, right? It's not like there is no, there's no, I, th- I think one could assume that because these things are all thought of as being in the Ethereum ecosystem, there would be some ability to publish to one and then proliferate out onto the others. Did you guys kind of explore that sort of architecture at all? Or is it just easier to publish to each one as if it's functionally an independent chain? Yeah, so Pith is on um, a bunch of different, you know, L2s right now. We're on, you know, Arbitrum, Optimism. Yeah. Pith treats these basically as independent chains. Like, we don't we don't really care that they are, in fact, kind of ultimately rolling up to Ethereum. And the reason we do this is actually because Pith, like, the, the pull architecture, one of the advantages of it is that it lets you treat basically any consuming chain uniformly. So like you don't need to have um, mm. a specific way to communicate with any given blockchain. So there's like really no benefit in knowing that they roll up. So, you know, because we're kind of generating all the price on PitNet, there's sort of one, um, there's one piece of kind of technical infrastructure, right? That is like right. taking all the prices from data providers, combining them, you know, signing them, making sure that you got these verifiable payloads. And that piece of like technical infrastructure is shared across all the different blockchains. And then, you know, you have these payloads and that's kind of like the common interface that all of the different, you know, layer twos or Ethereum or Cosmos chains share. And so that actually really simplifies the process of extending to other chains, because what you need to do is basically develop a contract that understands how to verify those payloads, right? And that's a relatively simple thing to do. Like you don't have to you know, have infrastructure for that blockchain where you like know how to send transactions and you don't even have monitoring or whatever. So um, because of that architecture, we could just kind of treat all these chains uniformly and it kind of just works. I I guess like I sort of assume that there would be more um, tooling available to mean that you could publish to like, for example, one optimism chain and then it would would connect into all the other OP chains. But that's not really something you guys are 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 seeing today is possible. No, I don't think that that's possible. I mean, I think it requires bridging in some form, you know, and like depending on, you know, how your roll up works, right? That bridging could actually take a long time, right? Like if you if you look at like the optimistic roll up bridging, like I think some of them have like a latency of like 7 days to go from the L2 back to the L1, and then you have to go from that L1 to another L2, like there's actually quite a few steps involved to do that. I want to talk a little bit about um most oracles have either a business model that depends on people paying to publish data, or they have a token or some component for that. Um, what is the sort of model that Pith is looking for long-term uh, sustainability on? So Pith actually has a monetization model today that's live. So with the pull oracle, every time someone puts one of these price payloads onto the blockchain, they actually pay Pith a small fee. So that fee right now is a placeholder. It's like, you know, one way or the equivalent on whatever blockchain you're on. Um, But that's something that governance, PIP governance in the future will be able to control. And so the idea here is basically, you know, the users of the Oracle end up paying for it. And like, 
as the user of the Oracle, you're already, you know, paying some transaction fees and things like that. So you're definitely willing to pay to do the thing that you're doing. And so this just gives Pip a way to basically collect a small amount of revenue from each user. And as usage grows, like you can expect those fees to kind of accrue to something meaningful. Yeah, this, I want to I want to dig into this a little bit more because there's this thing going on right now in the bear market, and this is across all ecosystems. But you know, the the one I'm most familiar with is the the problem on Solana, where there's like beloved open source tooling that is critical to the operation of a lot of protocols, but it's not really things VCs want to invest in. Like, there's a potential to add a fee at some point or something along those lines, but some folks are scared from a regulatory standpoint. Or some people just say like, hey, the, the fees we could add are still not really enough to kind of keep us us going. Uh, what do you think it is about oracles that have made it so that DeFi protocol creators or other people who are actually using the data, like of all the things out there, this is one of the, the few things in blockchains, like this and RPC calls that people find are actually worth paying for. I guess I sort of expected that at this point we would have more oracle uh more oracles that were actually being created by the protocols and they would basically say like look we're at dydx we're really big now or we're uniswap where we're uh you know a big protocol we can roll our own solutions at this point and not actually continue to pay oracle fees how do you sort of see oracles as maintaining their place in the market over the next few years well, there's there's a lot in that question. I mean, I think, you know, for that first part, right, like there's sort of a classic public goods funding problem for a lot of things. And, you know, it's not clear that you're going to have a good solution to that problem. Um, it just really depends on really the specifics of what you're building and whether there's a way to actually monetize. Right. So, you know, a lot of open source software has this problem. And I, I don't know if like there's a, a good way around that in general. Right. Now, for oracles in particular, I think a lot of oracles actually fell into this public good problem. Like if you look at some of these oracles that do these push updates on other chains, right, that you have that problem right there. I mean, once the price is on the blockchain, it's free for everyone to use. And, you know, yeah. Python Solana actually does this, right? So like Python Solana is yeah. kind of running a push model oracle. And like, it's really difficult to monetize that, right? Because the, the price is there. I mean, you could just use it. Like why? There's no... There's no reason to pay Pith in order to use it. So um, I think right. it you kind of have to, the, the way to solve a lot of these problems is you have to kind of get creative with the design of the of the system so that there is actually a place where you can monetize, right? And so, you know, I've been harping on the pull oracle a lot, but the pull oracle does solve this problem, right? That's an, another one of its benefits. There's actually a lot of benefits to this design. And so... Um, you know, that actually gives us a place to, to do the monetization. And then there's a question of like, okay, well, is that monetization sort of sustainable in, in the market, right? Like right. over time, you know, as other people enter the market, like where do those, mon like where do the fees paid to Oracle sort of uh, end up as a function of like overall transaction value or transaction fees or something, right? And obviously it's a little bit, it's a little bit early to say how that's going to play out. I mean, this market is very, very new. Um, but, you know, if you go and look at traditional finance for an analogy, right, you'll see that uh, market data fees tend to be about 20% of the revenue of like most big exchanges, right? So like, we're kind of using that as a rule of thumb in our head to say like, look, like, presumably those markets are somewhat rational. Like, there's clearly some value being placed on data in those markets. Like, if, you know, if the data weren't worth 20%, they'd probably charge less. Like, I don't know if yeah. like 20% is the right number or if it's like 25 or 15, but like, that's sort of our ballpark number that we're kind of using in our head. And um, I don't know. I think it, it might just play out like that, right? So as you kind of look at like the space of Oracle data, so, so Pith right now, what is the, like, it is a set of data that's available for different types of pricing. There are other types of oracles out there that are designed to bring in arbitrary data, like Switchboard is one example of that. Um, how do you think of, like, as this whole space evolves, there's going to be more and more need for custom data feeds. And those custom data feeds might not be terribly custom. It might be like, hey, we need to bring in the price of this, you know, uh, like, 
COBOL futures on chain. And currently there's no feed for COBOL futures, right? Uh, how are those sorts of things decided by the Pith Data Association in terms of what types of price feeds are, are supported? Or is that kind of more demand-based at this point? Um, yeah, I think there's kind of a design space for oracles, which is like, uh, there's maybe two axes, which is like, is the data sort of publicly available versus like, is it proprietary? And then mm -hmm. um, the other axis would be something like, is there a single source of that data versus like, are there multiple sources of it? Right. And so yeah. if you think about what Pit is focused on right now is we're really focused on the proprietary multi-source case and like, you know, financial market data is in that quadrant and is probably the most valuable thing in that quadrant. So that's kind of like our, you know, our real focus area. Um, but, you know, that doesn't mean that the Oracle that you build for that part of the quadrant is the one that you want for other parts, right? Like, if you really do want data that's publicly available on the internet, right, maybe the web scraping solution is a really good solution, right? So we, we're not... Um, we're kind of not really even competing in that area. And I think like, you know, solutions that other people have built there are actually pretty good, right? So that's just not the thing that Pit this for. Pit this for this proprietary multi-source data that is yep. like, you know, financial. And we think like a lot of the really valuable data is there, which is like one of the reasons why we're in that quadrant. Um, yeah, I guess like the thing I would say is there's a lot of proprietary financial-ish data. Like mm -hmm. uh, energy markets, you could think of as an example of something like that. Like the the scope of, and I'm, I'm sure you know, with your you know previously working at Jump, like the scope of what one can trade for financial gain using proprietary data is is nearly endless at this point. So so how do you guys kind of think about like what that that scope is, right? Like you could see a world where like okay, like the the treasury rate should be something that's brought on chain. That's not necessarily proprietary. You look at something like energy markets, like that is at that point, there's not like one public data feed you can get the price of energy from. But like how much of the of the work for Pith is running ahead of where the current um, DeFi and crypto markets are and how much of it is like tracking, like what are people building? I'm thinking about all the new attention yeah. that real world assets are getting nowadays and, you know, uh, folks looking to do things like bring all sorts of tokenized funds on chain as well. Yeah, yeah. So I think um, for us, like the good thing about Pith is that we have access to a lot of this data, right? Like if, you know, if it's a thing that someone can trade, like some of the Pith data providers are trading it, you know? Yeah. Some of the Pith data providers are probably the biggest market makers for that thing. So, yeah. you know, we can definitely get access to those prices. And I think, you know, advantage of like the first party design and all that. Um, in terms of actually putting it on the blockchain, like, look, if you have access, it's not that hard to actually turn on the price feed, right? Like actually getting access sure. to the data is the hard part. Um, so for that, we actually tend to be somewhat reactive. And if people show up and they're like, hey, I want this treasury on chain, we go, oh, okay, yeah, we could do that. And then like, we'll go, you know, turn it on, right? Um, this can be challenging for some types of financial assets that like don't quite fit into the, the current price feed model. Right. Like this doesn't tend to be a problem right now so much because people basically want things that work like cryptocurrencies, like they want things that trade 24 seven and things like that. Um, but, you know, you can have like yeah. features that expire at a certain point in time and then you need to roll them and you need to decide like, oh, how do I want to manage the feed for like the December 23 future and the January 24 future? And when does the 23 one disappear? You know, there's some like logistics around the traditional finance markets that tend to be a little more complicated. And currently yeah. we don't really handle those types of assets, but at the same time, nobody really wants them. Um, so right. a bit of a tangent, but the, you know, the, the point is like for a lot of things that people want, it's pretty easy for us to list them. And then like some of these more esoteric things I think are probably in scope, but like, you know, we'll, we'll start working on it when people actually seem to want it on chain. So, you know, at this point, Pith has been live for a while and, you know, you guys started out on Solana, you expanded to all these other chains now. What have you guys kind of learned over the last year or so of operating Pith in a bear market? Are, are there things that came up that w that ended up being problems or something you had to address that you guys hadn't thought of with sort of the massive volatility we've seen over the last 12 months? 
um, or just bear market activity in general, changing how people are consuming and using the protocol? Yeah, it has definitely been an interesting journey. Um, the bear market has definitely been been one part of it. I think you know we've definitely seen a lot of um, you know a lot of cases where you have assets where like they're kind of trading at different prices on different exchanges, or there's like a lot of volatility. Like I'm thinking about you know the USDC DPEG kind of earlier this year. So there's definitely been some um, some incidents there. I think we actually haven't had any problems for those things. It's been kind of a good you know test of the infrastructure and things like that. But um, things have actually operated pretty smoothly through all of that, um, all of that volatility. I think there has been some trends in the bear market that I think are definitely noticeable. Um, one is that it seems like a lot of people are getting very interested in, you know, trading on the blockchain and using DeFi over centralized exchanges, right? So I think you've seen the emergence of, you know, solutions like perps and and stuff like that that all run on chain. And like you see a lot of growth in those markets um, relative to using a centralized um, exchange. So I think that's been been something we've seen a lot of like a lot of PIP users um, end up building those kinds of things. And so that's been interesting. Um, that's been good for us because, you know, those kinds of protocols do want really low latency and high frequency feeds. Um, so that's been a trend. Another thing that's been interesting has been to see kind of the, just like the differences between different blockchains, like as Pith has, you know, we started on Solana and like, that was really the first blockchain, you know, I ever programmed for, right? So that's kind of like where my head is at in terms of like how blockchains work. And then it's been very interesting to kind of go and be like, okay, now we're going to work on Ethereum and go look at, you know, how the, um, you know, how things work over there. And I think, you know, there've definitely been some pros and cons, I think, of basically every every ecosystem, right? That, that's that been kind of an interesting set of lessons. Like, you know, I mentioned this before, but like Solana is really, really fast and cheap relative to other chains. Like it's truly, truly shocking. And like, there's other chains that advertise themselves as cheap and it's like, Actually, Solana is 100x cheaper than this. And like the things that Pith is doing on Solana mainnet, like they just won't work here or they'll be like really, really expensive. Um, so that's definitely been like one thing that I've noticed. Like, you know, another thing is like you go to Ethereum and like there's actually a lot of infrastructure on Ethereum that you don't really have elsewhere. And like this actually touches a lot of different um, parts of the stack, like like custody and like, you know, multi-sigs, like those kinds of things like tend to just be built on Ethereum because it's first. Um, or like, you know, we were yeah. looking for uh, we were looking for a solution to kind of basically run an off-chain service, like a keeper service, right? And like, there's a lot of keeper services on Ethereum because like they've had a lot of time to build there. Um, so it's, I don't know, it's just been kind of interesting to kind of compare and contrast the ecosystems like that. Um, yeah, that is really interesting. Um, I, I'm always, I've always like... It's always fun to talk to folks who have that sort of broad-based perspective of having built the same, if not a very similar thing, on lots of different software implementations and lots of different blockchains and seeing sort of, oh, we have to do it this way on this one because of this reason. It's very interesting to kind of hear and see that work. Yeah. You know, the third thing that I think has really been um, interesting for me or like maybe a mindset shift or something is like... uh, you really have to design your software differently in the sort of crypto world in general, because it's like, it is so, like the security and the reliability are so, so important. So, um, you know, in in Web2, right? Like, look, before I, I worked on Pit, like I was part of a startup, we did some natural language processing, we ended up building like the, the calendar assistant in Microsoft out, right? And it's like an NLP system. And it's like, look, like, you have some bugs in your software. It's like, yeah, you know, it doesn't return the right event. Like, it's not the end of the world. You know what I mean? Somebody gets a bad user experience, not the end of the world. Um, whereas in crypto, it's like, look, you have a bug in your software and like there is millions, hundreds of millions of dollars at, at stake. And like, that's just a very, very different world to develop software for. And so um, one of the things yeah. that's definitely been interesting for me is like really internalizing like what it takes to build software to like that level of quality and that like security and reliability standard and um thinking about like the practices that you need to basically ensure that like you never have a problem basically well 
Hey, thanks for joining us today on Validated to chat a bit about Pith and the future of, of this. I, I, uh, I really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks, thanks again, Austin, for having me.